Right, Proverbs 22, a scripture that, uh, you know, that we base our Christian school on. We have a Christian school here, which is uh, God is good to us. It's like we're taking the lead in South Africa with Christian education. And uh, we made a lot of decisions this year that was rough. And the head officers were not happy with it. And I just stood there and I said to Hendrik, this is what we'll do. Hendrik came to me and said, what must we do? I said, we do what God says. You know, there's times when head officers hasn't got the answer. And God is breaking through for us. Everything that we decided, it seems like they're going to start doing it. But this is a scripture that we base Christianity or Christian education on. Verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Just look this way. That is the main scripture that Christian education is based on all across the world. In 1970, when Dr. Howard started Christian education, this is the scripture, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he shall not depart from it. So this scripture, in fact, is taken by the Roman Catholic Church, and they say, give me a child till he's seven, and he'll be a Roman Catholic for the rest of his life. They use this scripture, okay? Train up a child. So if you take the first seven years and train a child, that's the way he will automatically go, you know? But... Uh, sometimes we got to read on because some scriptures, you know, the verses has been put in by translators. The Bible was not written in verses. It was written as a letter. So sometimes we got to find out that two or three verses is a context. Sometimes a whole chapter is a context. Sometimes three, four chapters is a context. Sometimes the whole book. But here is two scriptures that stand together. If you read the original, you will see it's one sentence. Okay, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. The rich ruleth over the poor. And the borrower is servant to the lender. There's a lot of O's in this house now. Oh, man, I tell you, I wish this, you know, the audience microphones were louder that the people outside can hear. There was a lot of O. Oh. So, I train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The context is, he who has the gold rules. The rich rule over the poor. And the borrower is a servant to the lender. So, so many people lend from the bank to b pay their cars, pay their houses, mortgages on their homes, and you become a servant to the one that lent you the money because you are a borrower and you got to look into that guy's eyes, bank manager, say, uh, you know, I can't make it this month, can I just do it? So you become a servant. So here it is. Have you heard that word already? The golden rule? And they quote something from Matthew 6. Anybody heard the golden rule is? Okay, so today we're going to change it. The golden rule is. Come on, shout yes, amen, clap your hands, look happy. So the golden rule is he who has the gold rules. So we got to go back to the Bible and find out who is supposed to be the ruler. Why is it that the worldly people sometimes, and in the Psalms, you've got three or four Psalms that says this, I look at the wicked and the way they prosper, and I nearly lost my trust in God. And so many people say, those guys don't even serve God, and look the way they prosper. It's supposed to be just the opposite. The world is supposed to look at the church and to say, who are those fat cats? Who are those guys riding along on their camel eggs? I mean, they, they got to start looking at us and say, wow, why do they have so much money? We don't have to look at the world to say, oh, that guy just bought a Ferrari. That guy just bought a Bentley. That guy just got a Lamborghini. We're supposed to pass. They're supposed to come to church to look at the good cars. Hmm? I mean, they brought Jesus an old donkey and a new one. And when he came into Jerusalem, he dropped from the old one to the new one. I mean, even Jesus said, let's get a new one. <laughs> Is there one, a donkey that's never been used? I mean, Jesus didn't go to the used cars. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, who's a... <laughs> used donkeys. Uh, how long... Oh, this donkey has done 70,000 miles. 
this donkey, oh no, this donkey only did 300 kilometers, you know, he only went to Jerusalem back, Jerusalem back. Oh, this donkey went to Syria, he's, he's, he's got a lot of mileage on. Oh, there's a new donkey, Jesus, I want the new donkey. Huh? Okay, who's supposed to be the ruler? And uh, I'll just quote some scriptures for you. In uh, Romans chapter 5 or 17, it says, we reign, another translation, we rule. In this life, in one Christ Jesus, we rule. Psalm 8. Oh God, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou preparest praise for thee. If I look at the stars or behold the stars, the moon, the works of your hand, I say, what is man that thou think of him and the son of man that thou visit him? You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the work of your hands to rule. Okay, so who's supposed to be the rulers? We are supposed to be the rulers. But you know, we always submit to outside and we become the borrowers instead of the lenders. We become the people that always look for bargains instead of going to the best places. We're not supposed to go to the cheap stores. That stuff don't last long. We're supposed to go to the expensive stores. Sorry if I have an introduction like that. But it's time that somehow the Christians take a lead in riches and prosperity. Okay? So we are supposed to be the rulers. So something's wrong. So let's go to a scripture that we did previously. Okay, you've got the golden rule. Tell the person next to you, I'm going to walk the golden rule. So if you want to buy the CD later, that is the topic, the golden rule. Okay? So I'm going to walk according to the golden rule. I'll have the gold and I'll rule. I will not be a borrower anymore. I will be a lender. I'm going to be the one with the money. Okay, so one scripture that stands out, and maybe we'll quote it, we'll quote it a lot of times tonight. 3 John verse 2 says the following. Beloved, I wish above all things. You've got to listen very carefully because there's a lot of stuff in between that we know, see often that the scripture we just read. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Why didn't he put, uh, put it in another arrangement? Why does he first say, above all things I wish you may prosper? And then he says, be in good health. Because he don't want you sick and have money. What are you going to do with the money? So he says, I want you to prosper and be in health so that you can enjoy the riches. Amen. God wants your life to be a journey of pleasure and joy. God is not a joy breaker. God is a joy bringer. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I say again, rejoice. Hmm? The joy of the Lord is my strength. So God wants you strong, but first he wants you to have money. Then he wants you strong so that you can enjoy your life. Above all things, I wish that thou mayest prosper. Okay, let's look at the ruler story. Remember, Proverbs 13, 22. The wealth of the sinner are laid up for the just, amplified, and eventually it will find its way into your hands. Come on, everybody. Learn some scriptures. Say Proverbs 13, 22. The wealth of the sinner are coming to the just. Come on, say it again. Proverbs 13, 22. The wealth of the sinner are laid up for the just. So start memorizing scriptures. It's good to know the scriptures. Okay? So with that in mind, let's read. Verse 5. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, like an error. Everybody say there's an error, and it's an evil thing. Which proceeds from the ruler. Okay, say, I am the ruler. And there's an error. It's an evil thing. And I pray, deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. So today, I trust that you'll be delivered from that evil, which is an error, which proceeds from the ruler. So we are the culprits. Okay? Say, today, I'm going to get out of it. I'm not going to be a culprit. I'm not going to be a cause of the error. I'm going to rule according to the golden rule. I want you to get happy about this. Verse 6. Folly is set in great dignity and in high places, and the rich sit in low places. 
Okay, who is the rich? The rulers. Who is the rulers? The people of Almighty God. What are they supposed to do? To be the lenders and not the borrowers. Hmm? Here it comes. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking like slaves in the earth. Hmm? Come on, say, I'm the ruler. I reign in this life. Wealth is my portion. I'm going to live according to the golden rule. Okay, so the scriptures we quoted so far, Hebrews 2 says the same. It says, uh, someone say, somewhere wrote, what is man that thou mindful of him and the son of man that he visited you? Are set to, he said, now God has put everything under man's control. There is nothing that God didn't put under man's control. This is Hebrews 2. Then it says, but we do not see it yet. But we are able to see Jesus. In other words, if we look at the life of Jesus, he was a ruler. He didn't walk around with a crown and a scepter, but he ruled. He ruled over the waves, over the storms, over death, over sicknesses. I mean, if he came and there was no wine at the wedding, he just made wine. He doesn't say grape juice. Okay, when Jesus was there, you know, he changed the stuff into joy. I mean, when he came to a funeral, he just touched the coffin and the guy jumped out. I mean, imagine the people around the coffin. You know, rock around the coffin. I mean, that was being a good rock and roll song, you know. Drop the coffin on the rock. The guy rolled out, jumped out and said, I'm back. Hallelujah. You know? I mean, Jesus just did everything different because he ruled over everything. He was the ruler. So we are able to see that man can do it because Jesus became a man like us to show that nothing can be outside the control of man. I mean, when there was a storm, he just walked on the water. So they that wait upon the Lord will mount up like eagles. You know, when, when, when they sang that song, you know, I just saw my goodness, man. I saw myself on a rock standing and I turned into an eagle. I mean, everything, and I just felt the wind, and I just opened my arms for those who watched during the song. I just opened my eyes, and I just made a noise because everybody was, you know, the noise was loud, so they couldn't hear me. And I just said, wee! And I just, wow, mount up with wings as eagles. Whoa, soar on wings as eagles. And then I said, running and not be weary, walking and not grow faint. Man, it's time to rule. Hmm? Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60. When did I start? I don't know. Okay, Isaiah 60. 20 years ago we sang it. Rise, shine, for your light is come. Rise and shine. Remember? And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon you, and the glory shall be seen upon you. Gentiles shall come to your light, the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about, see them coming from far. Verse 5, then thou shalt see and flow together, and the heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, the faces of Forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Multitude of Mercedeses and BMWs and Bentleys. I mean, that time, that was what they drove with. We don't drive them today because they don't have steering wheels and wheel, wheels, you know. So we drive the other stuff today. Okay, Lamborghini shall cover with you. The, you know, mm, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. Man, all the ships and, you know, the jets and the Citation and the Learjets, they shall come from Sheba, shall come. I remember where the Queen of the South came from Sheba there in 1 Kings 10 and her breath was taken away and she said, they didn't tell me half the riches you have. And then Solomon blessed her. She gave him 666 talents of gold to show he's part of the beastly system. And, you know, he gave her more. <laughs> You got it there. Okay. Here it comes. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. I mean, I mean, where have you heard of gold and incense coming to people? Huh? At the birth of Jesus. 
I mean, there came this very, very wealthy, rich men from Magi from the East. What did they bring? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What to do? To honor the king that was born. I mean, Jesus showed an example. He said, man, you can get it when you're a baby. You don't have to wait till you're 30. Man, they're going to bring gold to the babies and said, yo, here's money for the baby. You know, open a bank account in the baby's name. I want to put one million in them. So, you know, when they're 18, they can go to university and that money can, you know, draw interest, you know. I mean, people need to come to you and say, can I get your baby's name? I want to open a bank account. I want to put 100,000 rand in there. I've got 100,000, 100,000, I've got 90, 90, 90, 110, 110, 120, 120, 130, I've got 130, 50, 50, 50, 50, I've got 150 there, I've got 60, I've got 160, anybody, 170, I've got 170, 180, 180 there, 200, 200, I've got 200, sir, for you, 200, 200, 210, 210, oh, there's another one, what, 300, oh my goodness, 300, 300, what have we got to go? Okay, you can put it in my baby's account, I mean... <laughs> Man, it gets worse. Verse 7. All the flocks of Kedah shall be gathered together unto you. The whole Mercedes fleet garages of cargo is going to be named in your name. You know, because the owner decided he looks for something. The rams, oh my goodness, of Nebajoth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance of my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Remember Haggai 2, the latter glory of the house shall be greater than the former. Verse 11, therefore, and you can read this verse now, what we read now is also in Revelation 21, verse 24 and 25. Yeah, we got it there. I, therefore, Thy gates shall be opened continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, so that men may bring unto you the forces of the Gentiles and the kings may be brought. You've got to read Revelation. They shall bring their gold and their riches. For the nation, the glory, verse 13, of Lebanon shall come unto thee. The fir tree, pine tree, box together. Man, the place of your feet shall be glorious. The sons also of them that afflicted ye shall come bending unto thee. And they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. And they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One. Come on, you are a city that is set on a hill. You are the light of the world. You cannot be hidden. You are Zion. You are the city. Man, O oh man. Oh, man. Verse 17, for brass I will bring you gold. For iron I will bring you silver. For wood I will bring you brass. For stones I will bring you iron. I will make thy officers peace and thy executors righteousness. Violence shall no be hurt in thy land. Wasting nor destruction within thy borders. The context is gold, money, camels, ships, boats. There shall not be wasting, no destruction. In other words, the killing, stealing, and destruction in your finance will stop. The abundance is coming to you. Come on, everybody say, the abundance. The abundance is coming to me. My gates are not shut. I will receive. When they bring the gifts, I will be ready to receive. Come on, say it. So many people, no, no, I can't take it. I can't take it. You soon, take it. Somebody wants to give you a car. Don't say, mm, why do you want to give it to me? You go, grab the keys. <laughs> go around the block. Call the man's harvest in. Hmm? I learned through the years, you know, if somebody comes and gives you 10 rand, be excited that somebody gives you 100,000 rand. For that guy, the 10 rand was great. Hmm? Don't despise when somebody gives you something and it's small. Take it and bless the guy. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, what else? Hmm? I mean, I think Jesus really showed a good example. But right through the Bible, the wealth of the wicked are laid up, or the sinners are laid up. And eventually it will find its way into the hands of the righteous. There's so many examples in the Bible, but a good one is when the children of Israel left Egypt in Exodus 12. And this is what God says, go strip the Egyptians from all their wealth. And the Bible says they went into Egypt and they stripped them of all their gold and all their silver. Imagine the immensity of the gold that they had so that Aaron could build that big calf. And after Moses destroyed it, that gold was thrown away. And they still had enough gold to build that tabernacle. With the Holy of Holies, with the Ark of the Covenant, with the brazen altars, you know, with the golden candlesticks. They, after they built a cow, a bull, 
And if you go into the history, that thing must have stood meters high. Solid gold. Hmm? You know, and Aaron was so deceived by the people when Moses said, what is this thing? Aaron said, you know what we did? We threw our gold in the fire and this thing jumped out. <laughs> Moses said, Aaron, you may be my brother, but you don't talk the truth right now. I mean, your story is too big. You know? Let's go to Jesus' example. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We talked about his birth and the gold and the frankincense that was bro- 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 brought to him. But look at his life in death. 2 Corinthians 8. I hope it's going to get a greater context for you today. Come on, we speak, we speak so much over our bodies and stuff like that. You know, I'm healed with the stripes of Jesus. You know, I said to the students this week, the Bible says, by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. So I said, then I are. Okay, you didn't get that one. When the Bible says, you are healed. So I said, all right, then I put my name in there. I are healed. It may not be good grammar, but I think it's a good revelation. I are. I, I, I'm not going to be. I are. I are healed. What about my finances are in good shape? I have no debt. I have money in the bank. I have abundance. You see, we, got a, uh, we read so many books, especially me and Kusi, on finances the last couple of months. You know, and it just comes out, poverty is a mind thing. You think rich or you think poor. And all the books, if it's a worldly writer, a Christian writer, somewhere they say poverty is not in the person's hands. Poverty is in the person's mind. So are wealth and riches. And it's proven. We just listened to somebody else again. But it's proven if you take all the wealth of the world and divide it between all the people of the world, everybody will get about at least 10 million dollars that's how much money there is in the world and they say within four years all the poor will be poor again and all the rich will be rich again so they did a study of it and they took like something 80 people and they gave them all a million dollars and after two and a half years one guy was a multi-millionaire And the nine others had no money. They were back where they started. Proven. So, say, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to think rich. I'm going to think rich. I'm going to stay well, clothe well, drive well. So all will be well. Well, well, well. (laughs) Yeah, all going to be well. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you are becoming, I'm reading Amplified, for you are becoming progressively acquainted with and recognizing more strongly and clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. His kindness, his gracious generosity, his undeserved favor and spiritual blessing in that though he was so very rich, Jesus was a ruler. From birth he had the gold already. Though he was so very rich, Yet for your sakes, he became so very poor. Where? On the cross. That's where they stripped him. He hung there naked, stripped from everything. In order that by his poverty, I don't know if you can handle this. Can you handle this? That you might become enriched, abundantly supplied. King James, that you might be rich. Okay? But what is the context? The context is verse 1. We want to tell you further, brethren, about the grace of God which has been evident in the churches of Macedonia, arousing in them a desire to give. For in the midst of an ordeal of severe tribulation, their abundance of joy and their depth of poverty have overflowed in wealth of lavish generosity on their part. So what did the poverty do with these guys? They gave and it caused a wealth of abundance of wealth to flow together to them. He says, I can bear witness they gave according to their ability, beyond their ability, begging us most insistently for the favor and fellowship of contributing to the ministration of the saints in Jerusalem. I don't want to read more. I think everybody can get it here today that... uh, My goodness, man. It's in giving that you receive. It's in sowing that you reap. It's in tithing that you're blessed. 
It's an offering that you get. Come on, somebody. You don't just get, you know? Oh, oh, now there's a group of people that say, no, 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 brother. If you give to get, it's law. I say, huh? <laughs> don't give. Stay poor. Kubis, how do you break through in finances? You know, because we now believe in grace, so we don't believe in do to get. So how can, how can we get our church to financially just grow? I say, give. No, but then, then we're back in the law. I say, <laughs> okay. Say, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to act on it. And I'm going to get it. Okay, here's a good one. Faith is a fact. But faith is an act. Faith is a do word. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith without works is dead. That's why in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, where the first faith guy that they talk about is Abel, by faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice than Cain. I mean, that's Genesis, man. It's the first story of the first people. There, I mean, there was no Moses. There was no Mount Sinai. There was no law on tables. Hmm? And nowadays, you can't, you can't kill animals anymore. This is now another group. You know, you're not allowed to eat anything that comes from animals, clothe yourself with anything. We've got to be animal friendly. Uh, I, I wondered, Jesus killed the first animal. And he made clothes for the people in the garden. And then he told them to sacrifice that thing and eat it. So now I get letters to go back to Genesis and eat just vegetables. I said, yeah, I just eat vegetables and fruit. I don't like meat. <laughs> but every now and then, you know, maybe a little chop, you know. No, but you can't kill animals. But God killed the first animal. God instituted sacrifices and for them to eat the meat. God said they must eat the lamb. So don't make a law of stuff. Read the whole Bible, not portions to suit your doctrine. I don't know why I say this, but what I'm trying to say is Abel was the first man that God says had faith. And his faith was he gave. Let's go to Proverbs again, chapter 10. Okay, here it is. Okay. You know the people next to the road, two to feed, no job, no money. At the bottom, God bless. God bless. Remember that one day I told you, I went through Klagsdorp to every corner where they stand and I, and I took 1,000 rand and I gave each one of them 100 rand. Brother, the, the, the experience, I, I should have had a video camera with me. All of them like fell on the ground. Oh, Oh, God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. I say, yeah. I'm blessed. But you are not blessed. Okay, listen to this one. Here it comes. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Are you prepared to say to God, and we're going to come to that scripture 10 minutes from now, so are you prepared to say to God, God, you see I'm not lazy. I expect to be rich. I'm diligent. I'm always on time. I do my job well. And your Bible says, if my hand is diligent, I will be rich. Are you prepared to challenge the almighty God? And we're going to come to a scripture that's going to shock you today. To say to God, Lord, there's my checkbook. This is what I gave to the church. Lord, your word says, if I bring my tithes and my offerings, this is what will happen. You said, if I give, I'll receive. If I sow, he that waters will himself be watered. Uh, shall we just come and see that the thing is done? Send your holy angel. Look, we can't talk to God like that. That's why you haven't got. Are you prepared to take God on his word and say, this is your word? Hmm? When I just got saved, we listened to a guy, I can't remember what his name was, and he preached it. He said, I lift my Bible up and say, God, you can see that? 
I mean, it comes from you. Here it says that holy men wrote by the holy anointing. So this must come from you. So can I please see it? Yeah. Hmm? Are you prepared to do it? Let's read on. Verse 22. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, addeth no sorrow with it. Amplified. Neither does toiling increase it. So I got to put the two together, the grace and the faith. The one is I can't earn it. It's mine because of the promise. The other side is I got to do something to get it. Because faith without works is dead. We are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that nobody can glory in the presence of the Lord unto works. Have you read the context in Ephesians 2? We are saved without works to be able to work. In other words, grace came, faith arose, I received, but now I must do to get. I must now operate faith. Hmm? Okay, says it doesn't take toiling. Let's pick it up in Luke 5. That's the story, isn't it? And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesareth and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto them, Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draw. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, this is so awesome. Together with Proverbs 10, 10 and 2. We have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Here comes Proverbs 10, 22. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their net break. Wow. Wow, well, say, I received that. In other words, it, it's a two-sided coin. You can't have a coin with one side. If you have a coin with one side, it means it's a picture. Which is a shadow. The only way you can have a coin with one side, either it's glued to something or it's a picture of something. But a coin has two sides. You know? So I've got to look at both sides. So on the one side, he said, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and your toiling will not do anything to it. The other side says, you've got to have a diligent hand to come rich. It's one chapter. So if I don't do, I don't get. If you just sit on your blessed assurance, I mean, money is not come running to you and wave their heads and their buffaloes and say, here's the big five, here's the big five. Can you get me from the front door? I'm here to bless you. I'm here to bless you. You know, you've got to act on the word. So P Peter said, at your word, Lord, at your word. So what is the word of the Lord saying? He became rich so that we can be... No, he, be, he was so rich, became poor, that we that are so poor can become so very rich. Good example. Go to Second Chronicles 20. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. The story of Jehoshaphat. Remember the three armies coming against him? Then he feared and he called a fast day that everybody was supposed to fast. And they sought the face of the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord came in the congregation. And there's one prophet stood up and he says, Fear not, neither be ye dismayed. For tomorrow go up against them, but you shall not fight. For the battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord. Remember the story? The battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord. Okay, let's pick the story up then. Where are we? At verse 20 will help. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. I hope you're writing down the points and getting something from it. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Here it comes. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. 
believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. In other words, if a man with a prophetic anointing and mantle teaches you, believe it, take it, and what's going to do? You shall prosper. You know, every time we take up an offering, it's not just to get an offering, it's to give you an opportunity to break through. So every offering is an opportunity to break you through. So you got to take whatever you have. It's a rand, a 10 rand, a 100 or a million rand. It's an opportunity to say, my goodness, if this is how it works, my prosperity is here and I take it, throw it in and then speak to it. Amen. Say, money, you're going to work. When you get out here today, you're going to work for me and you're going to make sure that I'm prosperous. Hmm? Make a date in 1997. No, 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 no. Yeah, 1997. December of 96 at Christmas, starting to 97, I said, I will get a brand new car delivered in my house by the end of February. I'm sick and tired of buying these cheapies and fix them all the time. My children is now getting big and they must all sit in a car that's rusted at the back. You know, and I try my best to, you know, every time buy another cheapie, fix it up and then sell the other cheapie because I fixed it up, you know, and then buy another cheapie, fix it up. I mean, that's how we went for years. So 1997 starting, I said, this is it. I've been sowing, I've been giving. Now, Father, I want a car delivered at my house. And I made a date. I said, by February. February, three farmers came to my house, knock at the door, says, Kubis, we are here to buy you a brand new car. <laughs> it was a big car. It was a nice car. It was even the color that I said. And they started phoning the agencies. And they couldn't find a car because it was on a waiting list. You know, somewhere with, with these cars, it's popular, come out, it's a waiting list. And you know which cars have the waiting list. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> And they phoned, and they found two, one in Bloemfontein, one in Polokwane, but it wasn't the right color. And he didn't know what color. He just said, what have you got? They said, oh, we got this white one. He said, no, it's not the right one. I didn't talk to him. And then phoned another one, say, oh, this is like, you're green, this is not the right. Phoned, eventually they said, there's a guy in Vereniging that canceled his order. If you phone, we don't know what color it is, but the guy just now canceled. So he got a call from one of the other branches. Said, There's a car that the guy ordered, but when he got there, that's not his color. So they found there and said, what color? They say, it's burgundy. I said, he didn't know. He was talking to the guy. He said, that's right. Could you deliver it in Klagsdorp? They said, we'll get in the car right now and deliver it. He said, we've got the cash. Okay. They delivered the car. I went and I fetched my checkbook of the, fine, the offering that I put in on New Year in our church. I said, this is what I wrote down. I want a burgundy, yeah. that new car. You know? And since then, I had new cars like four a year. And most of them I sell after three months, give the money to the church and I get another one. But I speak to it. I say, this is seed I'm expecting to reach a harvest. I go to the garages, I lay hands on the car, I say, this is my car, in Jesus' name I want it by tomorrow. I don't know why you should talk like this, but you know, a few years ago, remember, I sat in another car that was also on a waiting list. Also a new Mercedes series, and it was on a waiting list. And I sat in the car, lay my hands, and said, this is my car. The dealer came and said, you can't get this car, you can sit in as long as you watch, but it's ordered by a doctor. I got it from Port Elizabeth. It's for, I said, but this is my car. <laughs> so I thought, how am I going to buy it? Johan was sitting with me in the car. How are you going to buy it? I said, no, I don't know. I've got enough seed in the ground. No. So the owner walks away. He says, well, you can look at it, but the waiting list is six months. I said, Johan, put your hands in the car. This is my car. Father, I thank you for this car. Indeed, my cell phone rings. Hey, Kubis, where are you? I said, you're in Klaasdorp. But where are you now? I said, well, we're in town. He says, but where are you? I said, uh, well, in actual fact, I'm at a garage. He said, what are you doing there? I said, I'm just sitting in a car. He said, that's the vision that God gave me. You are sitting in a car. He said, I want to buy that car for you. Okay. But now it's the doctor's car. We walk out, we got in the car. 
We're not 100 meters from the garage. My phone ring. It's the garage owner. He says, Kubis, you can come back. The doctor canceled the order. <laughs> You've got to step into it. You've got to talk it. You've got to believe it. You've got to say it. You've got to do it. Hmm? But further. Oh, yes. Then, then I took the car home. And uh, I had to come and get the papers. It was Saturday morning, so I had to get the papers on the Monday. The guy said, I can't take the car so long. We come Monday, and here's the doctor. And he introduced me. This is Dr. Muhammad Ramshi from, you know, from Abdullah 3. From, you know. He says, Kubis, we've got a problem. The doctor wants the car. I said, no, you can't get it. It's my car. So I'm standing there with all the cash. I'm going to buy the car. The doctor said, Mr. Van Rensburg, I'll give you 20,000 rand just to get the car back. I said, no, I don't want the 20,000. He said, I'll give you 30,000 just to get the car. Now I'm standing here. This guy says, if he takes the car, he'll give me 30,000. I mean, when did you get 30,000? From Mohammed. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 21, and when he had consulted with the people, listen to this, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army and say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, praise the Lord. For his mercy endure forever. And when they began to sing and praise the Lord. I thought there was another guy also that did that. It's called Paul and Silas. They also praised the Lord. Remember when God started tapping his feet and the crack came. Bam, 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 bam. Okay. God set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, every one helped to destroy another. Hey, get the picture. Jehoshaphat didn't move. They were singing. Praise the Lord, for his mercy endure forever. And so, what's happening? These people are killing the, each other. The guy said, I know you for 20 years. Who's first? Bam, bam, pew. Just, yeah. And they started killing each other till there was no one left. And Joshua fed it. And at the end, you know, here stands the two kings. They say, yeah, we've been friends for 17 years. Come, put your sword there. Put your sword there. At the count of three. We're the last two. Why are we doing what we're doing? I don't know. I just feel we should kill one another. Huh? Okay, at the count of three. One, you got to push, eh? Oh, you got to push too. I mean, you're not going to drop me. Now I will not drop you. Hmm? Till death has do part. Let's go. <laughs> Verse 24. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were just dead bodies. Fallen to the earth, and none escaped. You thought my picture was wrong? None escaped. So how did the last two do it? On the count of three. Right. <laughs> Verse 25. <laughs> Verse 25. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came, listen, here it comes, to take away the spoil of them, they found among them abundance, both riches with dead bodies, precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering the spoil. It was so much. Say yes. Come on, take the scripture. Kiss it. Say yes, 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 yes. It's mine. Spargo, the wealth of the sinner are coming. Yes, Lord. You see it? We're going to tear it. Hmm? Isn't that just too much? Hmm? I just want to read you a scripture. I didn't add it in my mind, but I'm sure I know where it is. 26, just listen to this. This is the story of, you know, uh, Uzziah when he became king. And the Bible says, he sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God. 
And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Hmm? So I said, you got to say it, man. you got to speak to money. Say, money, you're my friend. You're going to work for me. We are not enemies. Please come back. Come back. Money, come back. Come back. Money, come back. I'm sure I saw you today, but you've been running away. Come back. Money, come back. <laughs> the stuff shouldn't run away, it should run to you. The Rolling Stones had a good song, Run to Me. Remember the Rolling Stones, Run to Me? Okay, if you were not among the stones, it's all right. Listen to God speaking to Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written it. For then you shall make your way prosperous. Come on, underline it, say amen. Amen. I will make my way prosperous. Hmm? The word in your mouth, the word in your heart. I mean, it's the same as Psalm 1. You will be successful, you will prosper. Why? Because if I speak the word, I've got a scripture behind me that pushes that word to the front. Isaiah 55, 11 says, 10 and 11, you know, we've quoted it so many times, but just get it. As the rain and the snow comes down from heaven and do not return to it, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall do what I send it for and it shall be prosperous therein. So i got to speak the word over my finances, over my checkbook, over my MasterCard, my Visa card, my whatever card I have, Edgar's card, Fushini's card, Truer's card. Speak to that card and say, card, you're not supposed to put me in debt. Oh, Lord. It's a lot of cards that put you in debt. Okay. <laughs> but you're going to bring money into me. Hmm? I told you last night, you know, the guy went to the ATMs and he thought all the banks in South Africa is bankrupt. (laughs) Went to the Net Bank, to Absa Bank, to FNB, went to all the banks and every time I put in the card, it says, there's no funds available. And he said to the guy, you know, it looks like all the banks are going bankrupt, they got no funds available. The guy said, no, it means your account has no funds available. And all the banks are in agreement that you have no funds available. (laughs) Then that red flash, sorry. I mean, that's an ugly thing on an ATM machine. I mean, that's when you feel you've got to kick the machine apart, especially if there's a lot of people behind you and they check the screen out when you put your card in. I mean, and you go so bold to put the card in, and every time it just says, sorry, there's no funds available. It's like, my goodness, there's something wrong with the bank, sir. We can all turn around. There's no funds. I've tried three times now. I've tried all my cards. It didn't work. Mm. Hmm? You've got to say it. Say, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches. Oh, my goodness. Not according to the riches of my job and my salary and my wages. God will supply for me according to his riches. The gold and silver is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Hmm? It all belongs to him. Hmm? It all belongs to him. Let's go to Psalms. Seeing that we got to sing, praise the Lord for his mercy endure forever. Praise the Lord. Okay, we're going to read the King James and the Amplified. Verse 27 of Psalm 35. Let them shout for joy. Come on. And be glad. Ha, ha, ha. That favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them. Here it comes. Underline it. Put stars and stripes there. Make marks there. Let them say continually. 
if you're an Indian, continually. <laughs> let them say continually. No, let them say continually. No, let them say continually. <laughs> let, what must they say continually? Let, continually, forgive me. Let the Lord be magnified which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, okay? Magnify. He, oh, man, God is so great. Just make him great. You are great. Oh, God, we magnify you. You're so awesome. You're so wonderful. Tell him, why? Because God has pleasure in your prosperity. God has said, that's right. Zap him with poverty. Come on, take his money away. Come on, let the dogs go lick him. Put him on the ash heap. And God says, that's right. You deserve it, you skunk. <laughs> You should have had two airship, not just one. <laughs> no. God says, why are you so poor? I came to bring the good news to the poor. Poor you don't. I only have pleasure if it goes good. And do you have pleasure when your children suffer? Would you do more to see to that your children get? Will you do without so that your children would rather have? Then if you are evil and know how to do good to your children, how much your father in heaven to you? You know, if I think of my childhood days, I said, my children's not going to be like it. They're going to have toys. And they're going to have cars at 16. Because you can't spoil your children. No, it says so. They took the spoils for three days. <laughs> hmm? How would you like to spend three days to pick up what they give you? Hmm? Three days, of, you, know, you know, I can't have this all. My room is full. I can't wear 12 rings at a time. You know, I can't put 20 chains around my neck. But give, let's put it in the safe. Let's put it in the safe. Three days. Did you know that Elvis Presley gave more to welfare than the whole United States government together? When he died, he had no money in the bank. They wanted to clear him bankrupt because he was just a giver. When he sang, he made like, you know, four million dollars at some shows. And he just took the money like that and said, just give it to welfare. Oh, just give some to this guy and that guy, but see that the rest goes to welfare. When he just made it in the rock and roll scene and he was 19 years old, his father married another woman. His mother was dead a long time. His father married a woman that had three boys. The one boy became Elvis's manager for many years when he grew up. But when the three boys arrived, it was late at night and they went to bed. And Elvis went to a toy shop because these boys were now like three, five, and seven. He went to a toy shop. He said, I want three of everything you have in the shop. They said, well, we're nearly closing time. Close at eight. He says, no, I want it tonight. I said, but how? He said, if you don't want to do that, can I buy the shop? <laughs> he said, I wanted to deliver at, at Graceland before the morning. Those guys jumped in and he said, in, in fact, I'll give you three times the amount of the price it's worth if you give me three of everything. They got a truck and they just loaded, 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 loaded. And he said, I want you to drop it all in my lounge. And the morning, Elvis was still sitting there in his white gown, waiting for the brothers to wake up. And as they came down the steps, they just saw all these toys. And Elvis said, I just thought, if you are now my brothers, because your mother married my father, then I want to make sure, as the son of my father, I will make you joint heirs of everything I have. I want to give and bless you like you've never been blessed before. I read the book, The Tale of Two Kings, and God said, he understood grace. That's why he called the praise grace land. Amen. You know, and he blessed those guys abundantly. If you that are evil, they know how to do. And he just played the role of the son of the father. And when the other sons came in, he said, well, then you're my brothers. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. Amen. So out of his riches, he wants us to be blessed. He became poor that we became rich. 
Come on, somebody say, my goodness, goodness gracious me.